Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to uh, another episode of Science and Technology Q&A for kids and others. And I see we have a bunch of questions uh, stored up here. Um, let's see, we have a question here from Frank. Uh, what are the biggest differences you notice about how physicists think versus how mathematicians think? That's sort of interesting. And I, I think for people who are tackling or experiencing mathematics at more of a school level, experiencing physics at more of a school level, some of these things that I might say uh, won't be obvious yet. I, I'll talk more about what professional mathematicians versus professional physicists, how they kind of like to think about things. You know, one of the features of physics is it's a field where people expect to just figure things out regardless of you know, what methods are gonna be used, what it takes, uh, whether you're absolutely sure you're right, they just sort of bash through and try and figure things out. Mathematics is much more a field where you're very careful. You say, can I really prove this? Can I really establish this? Am I absolutely certain of this? Can I move on? I need to be absolutely certain before I move on. It's been an interesting thing, you know, for people who study mathematics, study physics and so on, um, at the level of uh, people who go on and get, you know, PhDs and things like that, there's a very impressive record of people studying physics for their PhDs, maybe some very specific area of physics, and then going off and kind of being exported to all sorts of other fields uh, and, uh, and really uh, kind of transforming those other fields. I mean, this happened in molecular biology. Uh, the people who were sort of the, the most of the early people in molecular biology came from physics. It's happened in quantitative finance. Um, it's happened in a lot of different areas. You know, you, you discover that the people who uh, do things, oh, well, what were they trained in? They were trained in physics. Much more common to see that than to see that they were trained at least at the PhD level in mathematics. Mathematics tends to be something where you're more like, I'm gonna do these things, I'm gonna get it absolutely right, it's gonna be absolutely perfect, but it's not like, oh, I can go apply my thing to absolutely anything. You know, one of the things I often find interesting uh, I have many friends who are top mathematicians and so on. And uh, one of the things that's often amusing to me is that I'll ask them some question about some piece of mathematics that I kind of need to know about for something I'm doing. And uh, they'll think, they'll think, and then they'll say, I don't know. And the thing that I've discovered is, unless you hit absolutely on target, they're going to say, I don't know because that's the right answer in a sense, they don't know. Whereas if you ask that to somebody who's more of a sort of physics oriented person, they'll say, well, I don't know that exact thing, but there's these other things that are close by and you know, well, there's maybe a bridge from this to that. And it, it's all a bit more speculative. It's not sort of buttoned down precise, but it's, it's more sort of uh, uh, enterprising in a sense, uh, intellectually. So that, that's a little bit about um, uh, difference. I would say that it can be the case that physicists use certain methods, maybe mathematical methods these days, I hope computational methods as well. And they get, uh, they, they say, these are the methods we're using. And they're methods that in some cases are from mathematics that was developed a hundred years ago or more. Um, and, and they do what they can do with those methods. Mathematicians will also be be based on particular methods. So particular sort of methods of, of constructing proofs for things and, and making conjectures and going on and, and making proofs and so on. Um, the sum of what they're doing is, is much more abstract than physicists. Um, sometimes uh, it's, um, uh, I think mathematicians are, are sometimes very fond of sort of pure mathematics, which is sometimes defined as mathematics that doesn't connect to anything else. That's a bit unfair because it's turned out that a lot of mathematics that's been done, when mathematics is done with good kind of aesthetics, with good kind of uh, thinking about, uh, you know, what is the essence of what we're doing and so on, it's turned out that the mathematics is sort of almost inevitable, applicable to things. I remember meeting a, a person many years ago now, a, a person who worked on number theory, um, uh, who... Um, um, was sort of saying, well, we were very proud of the fact that uh, everything we did was absolutely irrelevant to the world at large. And it was just a question of doing these elaborate things about equations involving numbers and integers and all these kinds of things. And oh my gosh, then public key cryptography came along and pretty soon all of these obscure 
theorems that we had developed in number theory were incredibly relevant to computer security and things like this. And it was, uh, I think this particular individual was, was a little bit pleased that that had happened. But to some people, it was almost a, a shocking clash of cultures to see the fact that these things that have been developed as a matter of pure mathematics turned out to be relevant um, in, the, in the world at large. And I think sometimes, um, uh, you know, if I were to, to uh, you, you find people with, with just a great deal of kind of intellectual horsepower uh, working in professional mathematics, um, sometimes they have a good feeling for how the world really works, and sometimes they really don't. And so something that can happen is they can say, well, I'm going to make a model for how this thing in the real world works. And I'm a mathematician, and I know in a sort of an abstract way how this happens. And, um, uh, but, I'm, uh, but, but somehow the, the notion of, of what it's going to take to do something which has sort of the practicalities of things in the world is a bit lost. I'll tell one story. This is perhaps more of a historical story, but, but um, uh, I think it's sort of a fun story. The person about a person named Rene Tom, who was the inventor of this field called catastrophe theory. So catastrophe theory perhaps had the misfortune of having a sort of trendy name like that. This was a, a field particularly popular in the 1970s. Um, the actual idea of catastrophe theory is quite interesting and, uh, and, and not as sort of trendy as its name suggests. Let me, let me just talk a little bit about catastrophe theory and then I'll tell the story. So one of the questions is, if you, uh, if you try and, um, uh, you have some, some beam or something you press on the two ends. Well, for a while, the beam will just sort of, uh, it will may maybe compress a little bit. Um, but if you, press it, if you press it sufficiently hard, eventually it'll buckle. It'll either go up or go down. It'll buckle either buckle up or buckle down, so to speak. Um, and that phenomenon of this sort of bifurcation of whether it sort of goes up or goes down, that's kind of an example of one of these kind of, uh, a sort of a catastrophe kind of thing. Give you another example, which seems like it might not be related, but actually is. So if you look in your average coffee cup, I don't happen to be a coffee drinker, but I certainly see coffee cups. You look at an average coffee cup and you look at the, the pattern made by light um, as it uh, goes on the surface of, of your coffee or whatever else. Okay, you see a very strange thing. You'll see, you might just see, oh, there'll just be a blob of light, but actually no, it's not a blob of light. It's a, it's a strange pattern that has a cusp it has a sort of discontinuity. It has a, it kind of goes goes around like this, and it has a place where it kind of has it, it kind of discontinuously uh, makes this curve. Okay, so that cusp is a, is another example of a catastrophe made in a very different way. Uh, the way that's made is is the following. So, uh, if you imagine light coming into your coffee cup, the light hits the side of the coffee cup, and then it's reflected from the side of the coffee cup and winds up. Uh, going on the, the surface of your coffee. So the question is, when you have a bunch of parallel light rays coming from a light that's far away, like the sun, for example, what happens to those parallel light rays when they're reflected off the side of the coffee cup? Well, okay, so this is now a matter of mathematics. Uh, there's the one, so one thing you might think would happen, oh, there's the, the coffee cup is kind of rounded, so all these rays of light will be concentrated at, at somewhere. So it turns out a mathematical fact is that the only shape that perfectly concentrates things is a parabola or a paraboloid when it's, when it's sort of rotated around. So a parabola is the shape that's made by a quadratic function like x squared, for example. And it turns out that's the shape that you need to make things so that if you have a bunch of parallel rays, the, when the rays are reflected, depending, it doesn't matter whether the ray is reflected from the middle of the, of the object or from the side of the object, it will always be concentrated at the same focal point. And so this idea of a, of a parabolic reflector, that's what's used, you know, when you see radio dishes, for example, there'll be parabolic reflectors or there'll be paraboloids that are concentrating themselves, uh, concentrating all these, all these rays that are the radio waves that are coming in, concentrating them at a point. So there's the highest intensity for the detector, which is gonna pick them up. Uh, the same will be true with a solar collector. If you have a, a collection of a, a mirror that uh, is a solar collector, will have the same feature that it's trying to uh, take all the sun's uh, light that falls on any part of the of the of the collector and concentrate it all at the focus where it might heat something up or something like this. So these are the 
the kind of um, things that you see in um, uh, uses for parabolas and paraboloids. So for example, the Hubble's, Hubble, Hubble Space Telescope, um, is uh, its mirror uh, is, a, is a paraboloidal mirror. Well, it had some issues and it had to have various sort of corrections put on, but it's basically a paraboloidal mirror. Sometimes when people make paraboloidal mirrors, they use a, a trick, which is that a parabola, it's a mathematical uh, figure, and in modern times, you can imagine just sort of 3D printing that paraboloid perfectly. But in, in older times, one of, the, one of the cool ways to make a paraboloid is you take something like mercury, liquid mercury, and you spin it around. And it so happens that fluid dynamics is such that the shape you get when you spin a liquid around is a paraboloid. The surface of the, of the liquid becomes a paraboloid. And so one of the tricks for sort of making uh, uh, you could imagine making mirrors for telescopes that are going to con that are going to focus light was to spin mercury, for example, uh, to make that paraboloid. But anyway, so paraboloids focus everything at a point. Your average coffee cup is not a paraboloid. Your average coffee cup is circular, and circular uh, circles um, just or, or, or cylindrical um, that doesn't focus things at a point. Instead, it focuses things on this so-called core stick um, that is this, uh, this funny shape with a cusp in it. Why is it called a core stick? Core stick is because that comes from a Latin word, I guess, which means to set things on fire. And um, it's, uh, uh, I guess, means, means fire. Um, the, uh, and, and the point was that if you were, had a bunch of mirrors and you were trying to... Uh, you know, attack the enemy from a distance, so to speak. One way you could do that is to try and concentrate the sun and uh, try and, you know, burn things and so on. And so that was uh, uh, that's sort of the origin of this term caustic. But one of the places where you see these caustics is in um, uh, uh, is when when you have sort of parallel light and um, you um, uh, you end up with a, a um, uh, knot. Uh, and, and something like a coffee cup that's circular, it doesn't concentrate things at a point, it concentrates things on a caustic. You also see those caustics, for example, if you look at the bottom of a swimming pool, you'll see those kinds of caustics forming as a result of the light being refracted through the surface of the water um, as the water has little, little um, uh, uh, ripples on it and so on. So anyway, one of the things that uh, one can study is this question of kind of, when you have sort of the surface of water and it's rippling around in different ways, how robust is it that you have precisely these same cusp like caustics and so on? And the answer is it's surprisingly robust. It doesn't matter much what the detailed shape of the water is, it doesn't matter much what the detailed shape of the coffee cup is, you'll always get the same kind of cusp like shape. And so that result is kind of a deep result about structural stability. Um, that one can think of as a sort of deep result about geometry. It's a very deep, pure mathematical result that um, comes out of the uh, uh, sort of a, a, a theory of, of uh, mathematical forms. So the person who developed this uh, back in the 60s, I guess, primarily was, was René Tom. And um, uh, René Tom then wanted to take these ideas and kind of generalize them to different areas. And uh, for example, he tried to generalize them to biology uh, he tried to use catastrophe theory and this notion of sort of continuous changes of, uh, of like orientation of rays producing discontinuous uh, kind of effects to explain things like uh, why you would have a biological organism where, you know, one part of it would turn into a wing and another part of it would turn into a leg. Um, so he wrote a book about uh, biological uh, morphogenesis, the creation of form in biology, and I was always a bit sad when I saw this book because this book was a required kind of elaborate knowledge of biology and elaborate knowledge of algebraic topology and various other areas of mathematics. And the set of people with those kinds of elaborate uh, domains of knowledge was basically zero. There was basically nobody who, who knew uh, expertly both those fields and, and the book kind of required those. But I'm, I'm, I'm talking to you about uh, sort of ways of thinking of pure mathematicians. I remember meeting René Tom once, um, and uh, he, was, uh, he was very, very keen to discuss the question of why the sky is blue. And it's like, why are you talking about this? 
This is a fairly well understood piece of physics to do with Rayleigh scattering and uh, properties of atoms and, and all this kind of thing. What does this have to do with the pure mathematics of catastrophe theory and so on? And he had some theory, which I which I never understood. But my strong suspicion about it was it was a it was a theory that that sort of didn't really connect. There was mathematics that was very interesting and quite robust. And there was kind of understanding of sort of the magnitudes of things in physics that was just way different from that. And um, so that, that was sort of an example of where things can go wrong when sort of pure, math pure mathematics is directly applied to sort of modeling the natural world. Now, having said that, in our current fundamental theory of physics that we've been working on the last couple of years with, with great success, one of the things that's just amazing is that a lot of areas of pure mathematics that have been developed over the course of the last century or so that have not really seemed like they're going to be applicable to anything are applicable to uh, in our models. A lot of things to do with things like higher category theory and topos theory, a lot of very elaborate things where when you read the mathematics papers, it's like, why would anybody care about this? This is so elaborate, so abstract, but it turns out there's a really good reason to care because it's probably how our universe is made. So that's kind of a really neat, neat thing there. And it's sort of interesting to see over the years, mathematics gets developed and then mathematics gets used. And there's usually a delay between the mathematics being developed and the mathematics being used. But it's interesting to see what mathematics has actually been used. So for example, the mathematics one learns in, in sort of uh, elementary education, arithmetic, things like that, that was all pretty well codified by the 1600s. Um, and the methods that people use to do addition sums and so on with all those carries and all that kind of stuff, a long multiplication, long division. I never really learned long division myself. Um, it's, uh, uh, but those, all those various methods, um, they, were, uh, they were developed by the 1600s, 1700s. And you'll find I have copies of a bunch of old books that um, were people who were sort of, uh, who made a living teaching merchants how to do arithmetic. And they would all have their secret methods for doing this is the way you can do the, you know, casting out nines and the rule of Z's and the, the uh, rule of threes and all this kind of all this kind of stuff, all these kind of uh, cool sort of trick methods for doing various kinds of computations, which was an important thing because obviously there weren't computers in those days. And if you were a merchant uh, and you wanted to, you know, charge 12 percent interest on something, it was really uh, you had to actually be able to do the computations necessary. But you know, other areas of mathematics, like calculus, for example, it got pretty well developed in the 1700s. And um, uh, that's a, sort of another area that one learns today in sort of math education. There are other areas that um, uh, pretty much all of the discrete mathematics that we do today is much more recent. People always thought discrete mathematics was kind of trivial. It's actually much harder than continuous mathematics in the end, um, but it didn't really develop until, uh, until well into the 20th century. As a, as a serious field. People had worked on it earlier than that, but it didn't really develop in the way that it has. But it's always been interesting to me that there are some fields of mathematics where they developed, they got quite advanced, and they've never had a use found for them. So there's an area of transfinite numbers. I think I've talked about that a bit before here um, that was developed in the late 1800s, which is still waiting for a real use, although it may be getting closer now. But, um, and I would say that, you know, much of the time, mathematics gets developed, and then it gets used in physics some amount of time later. That amount of time may be decades, it may be half a century, it may be a century. I don't think there are too many examples of it being much longer than that. The other thing that happens is that the mathematics isn't available. And so the physicists just go and say, you know, I don't care that the mathematics isn't available. I'm going to invent my own sort of... Uh, perhaps very uh, sort of unrobust version of the mathematics to do the physics that I want to do. So uh, uh, my longtime friend, Dick Feynman, who is a well-known physicist, invented this method for studying quantum mechanics called the path integral. And uh, uh, mathematicians are still trying to discuss what on earth does the path integral really mean? For physicists, it's like, okay, yeah, we can work things out. We can do calculations. Oh, there's some limit we have to take. We don't really know if that limit is going to work at a mathematical level, but you know, it's, it's probably going to work. And in actual physics, it's a limit over this number of orders of magnitude, and it's probably going to be good enough. And that's kind of the approach of physicists. Uh, sometimes they have to make their own mathematics 
And uh, what's happened actually, particularly in the last few decades, is mathematics that's kind of been made by physicists has then been fed back into this kind of uh, process of being made more precise that mathematics is really good at. And I know from our physics project, we have spun off a really very rich collection of mathematics that I think some mathematicians are already starting to try and try and nail down. I mean, I think the, the nailing down process will take a long time and uh, be involve a lot of very interesting and, and difficult abstract things. All right, that was a long answer to that. Um, well, let's see, there's a question here from William. A typical text file is a few kilobytes, a typical audio file, a few megabytes, a video file, a few gigabytes. Uh, what would be a typical file size for smell, taste, touch? Is there a reason why quantitative change leads to qualitative change? Well, okay, so first question is, uh, what leads to those differences in the amounts of data necessary to represent, for example, sounds and images? You have to realize that what we're trying to represent is a sound good enough that when we hear it, it sounds right for an image an image that's good enough that when we see it, it looks right. And so a lot of that question about how much data there needs to be in that sound or that image depends on how we perceive sounds and images. And so that kind of gets us to look at what happens in our brains and in our eyes, there's the nerve, the optic nerve that goes from, from the retina on the back of our eye to rather poorly engineered to the back of our brain, to the visual cortex, has to go all the way through the brain um, to get there. The optic nerve carries all the information, maybe, I don't know, um, maybe 20 times a second, roughly, there's sort of new data going through the optic nerve saying, this is the image I'm seeing. And uh, so the optic nerve has a, have a certain number of fibers in it. And that those represent essentially the pixels in the image that we see on our retina. Our retina has a bunch of photo of light sensitive cells and uh, those light sensitive cells are, are connected to fibers in the optic nerve. And the basic bottom line is that there are about 10 million fibers, I think, in the optic nerve. Um, they're, they're actually a smaller number of, 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 of frontline cells on the retina, um, but there are a bunch of cross connections that help us to sort of uh, make, Im improve our vision, actually very much like the way that modern cell phone cameras improve their vision um, by doing various kinds of local image processing, even in the in, in the camera, so to speak. But anyway, so so for us, there are about 10 million fibers in the optic nerve, um, and that kind of gives us a sense of scale of how much data we're we're going to end up with um, for um, uh, the um, uh, for um, uh, it, well, from our visual system. So in rough terms, the reason that, you know, the few megapixel image is the one that seems right to us is because we have a few mega uh, nerve fibers in our optic nerve. Okay, so what about sound? Well, we have an auditory nerve as well that goes from our cochlea, our inner ear, to the, 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 the sound center, auditory center in our brain. Um, that nerve has, I don't know how many fibers it has, maybe tens of thousands of fibers of that order. It has vastly fewer fibers than the, than the optic nerve. And, and that's sort of fundamentally why uh, we get less data from sound than we do from, from, uh, uh, from, from vision. Um, and what's happening there is, uh, in the case of sound, what we're doing is we're sampling a sound at a certain frequency. So like the standard frequency is 44 kilohertz. That's the frequency that uh, audio CDs sample at. And that's sort of a typical sound frequency. Now, a cell phone, well, one of the original things that you know Alexander Graham Bell kind of innovated with in developing the telephone was just how low a data rate can you go and have people still be able to understand things. Um, uh, the, um, the, um, it's, uh, so, the thing that, um, uh, so, so anyway, in, in, in things like even cell phones, it's kind of shocking how low the data rate actually is. It's often eight kilohertz. Um, and then there are all kinds of ways that the, that the underlying kind of um, uh, data has been compressed and is sort of expanded again. And it's kind of like, you're just 
it, it's sending through something which is kind of like, oh, this vowel got said. It doesn't quite work that way, but roughly. And then the the at the at the end where you're hearing it, that's sort of that, oh, it was the vowel A got said. And that turns into an ah sound. It doesn't quite work that way. It works in a more kind of mathematical way rather than a way that has to do with the actual meaning of, of the of the sounds and so on. But in any case, so so with for us, by the time we get to 44 kilohertz, that's pretty much perfect rendition of sound. Why is that? Well, it's because our ears, if you're young, maybe you can hear up to 25 kilohertz. Uh, somebody like me, I'm down to uh, about 20 kilohertz, I think, which is actually pretty good for somebody as ancient as me, um, but uh, maybe a little lower than that. I haven't tested it in a while, but usually as one gets older, um, it's uh, those hair cells in the, in the um, uh, inner ear get more sort of gummy and one can't, uh, well, they, they're not sensitive to as high frequencies. This is a don't go to, don't, uh, uh, don't expose yourself to too loud sounds because really loud sounds will destroy those, those hair cells in your inner ear, um, which means that you won't be able to hear higher frequencies, which means it gets harder and harder to actually be able to interpret um, uh, sounds and so on. So it's, this, is, this is one of those, don't expose yourself to very loud noises messages. Um, but in any case, back to the question of sort of the amount of data in these different cases. So vision, because of the optic nerve, it's megabytes, uh, you know, um, sound because of the auditory nerve, it's kind of, um, uh, well, I should say megabytes per image for, for vision. When it comes to a movie, it's, you know, gigabytes for a whole uh, you know, uh, hundreds of gigabytes for a whole sort of decent amount of, of video and so on, and uh, megabytes for a decent amount of audio. So, okay, the question that was asked is what about smell, taste, touch, and so on? So to assess that, we'd have to ask how many nerves are there, that how many nerve fibers are there in our olfactory nerves, um, and how many, how many nerve fibers are there that come from all of our touch sensors and so on, on all the different parts of our body, um, and I don't know the answer to all of those. I, I certainly do know that it's drastically variable between different species. So for example, we have pretty crummy olfactory uh, smell-based um, uh, data collection, um, whereas uh, animals like dogs, for example, have really good olfactory detection. Um, so I don't know the answer to how much data uh, for, for us humans, I suspect that we could get away with, with a remarkably small amount of data to represent um, things like smell and, um, and taste. Now, in practice, you know, a typical perfume or something that's a manufactured scent has hundreds of different chemicals in it. And exactly what effect from those chemicals is important in the way we smell them, I don't think anybody really knows. It probably has something to do with shapes of molecules, maybe vibrational states of molecules. It all has to do with the way molecules get attached to different sensors in our noses and so on um, that uh, are sensitive to different parts or components of that chemical uh, smell. But um, the question of exactly what parts of the smell we're really picking up and really paying attention to, I don't think that is, that's really known. Um, and I think, you know, the dimensions of smell, we don't really know, just like for color, we know red, green, blue are the kind of primary colors. We don't really know what the primary smells are. For taste, there's a little bit more analysis of what the primary tastes are. And, and there are a small number of them. But, you know, when it comes to taste, it's even more complicated because the taste buds on our tongues, they actually depend on, you know, when you taste something, it's because pieces of food are actually uh, chemically reacting in a sense with the, with, with or, or being sort of chemically sensed by the things in those taste buds. And it really matters in what, what the food is like. Did you mash it up and did it get little pieces of stuff, little, little particles in your taste bud? Is it liquid? You know, what's it really like? Those things are important to the perception of taste by taste buds. And so I, I don't really know what the uh, sort of what the dimension for that would be. Now, you know, people at various times have, um, in the effort to sort of make uh, sort of movie-like experiences as realistic as possible. Uh, I remember from my probably 1950s, there were this technology, I think it was called Smellorama, which was kind of a, um, a thing where, I think maybe it was even applied to television sets, 
um, where you would get, you know, there would be some event going on and um, uh, there's some, some video being shown. And then at the appropriate moment, some, some scent will be released and you would get also the sense of smell as well as a sense of, of sight. And I know that in like, you know, Disney rides and so on, I think they, they use those kinds of things they, they have. They've actually worked on, you know, making a, a certain smell to go along with the, the visuals and the sounds of, of a particular ride. Um, and, you know, one of the things that's, that's complicated about something like smell is that the, you know, when we remember things, there are things where people say, well, I remember the, you know, you, you smell something and, and suddenly you're being reminded of something and you didn't even know why you were being reminded of it. And it's because that smell matched up. It's like, that looks like blah, blah, blah. But actually that's, that smells like blah, blah, blah. But one of the things for us is that, for example, our human language is not well adapted to talking about smells uh, and, and so on. It's, it's, um, we don't have a huge vocabulary for talking about that. Um, uh, you know, vastly less than the vocabulary we have for talking about visual uh, objects and so on. So that's, uh, um, and I think when it comes to touch, one of the things I've been curious about is, is whether there's kind of a, a um, uh, you know, there are textures and you can say that's a rough texture, that's kind of a furry thing, that's kind of a, 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 a smooth thing and so on. But there's sort of a, a dictionary of possible textures and we still don't really quite know what that is. I mean, there's some recent work that's becoming, making it a bit clearer um, what the sort of uh, spectrum of possible textures actually is. And that's something that's kind of relevant because on some uh, mobile devices, there's starting to be this kind of electrical effect that can make your finger feel as if there's something on the surface of your phone. There's actually nothing there. It's a purely electrical phenomenon that's stimulating uh, the, the, uh, your finger um, as a uh, just directly and electrically, um, but it feels to you as if there's something on the surface of the phone. And that can be useful as a sort of a virtual button on the phone or something. And one can wonder, you know, can one make something where there's kind of a virtual version of some particular texture? And as, as uh, you know, things change in a user interface or something, you feel a different texture and so on. And that's, some, uh, that, that's something that's sort of probably a coming attraction. And I don't think we know uh, what the, um, uh, how much data is going to be involved in that. My guess is a rather small amount of data for us. But, you know, different organisms have very different sensory systems. Even, even humans who, who uh, you know, who are vision impaired in one way or another will have more sensitivity to different sounds, more touch sensitivity and so on. And, and quite possibly there's sort of rerouting of, uh, of brain channels where you know somebody who has you know got standard vision like like me, um, you know would be using all of that brain capacity to deal with all the data that's coming in from my visual field, um, but somebody who's uh, uh, where they they don't have vision um, can um, uh, can use that sort of that brain capacity to deal with sound or with uh, with uh, with touch for you know that that's a um, uh, and and that that's sort of a uh, a, a different direction. I'm not sure how well understood it is, how those different brain areas um, get sort of entrained in, in to be used for different purposes. I know a few examples of where, uh, you know, brain areas will get bigger and smaller um, in terms of, of, of uh, uh, how, how much of one's brain gets used for some particular kind of function, um, depending on how much, uh, how, how often one is exposed to that kind of modality. Well, let's see. Um, okay. Humph. Um, wow. Okay. There's a um, it's a question here. Um, see, this is a nice, good test of uh, its uh, name is written out in Greek, so it's uh, Thanasis. Um, is asking. This is a yeah, okay. This is a slightly peculiar question for this 
collection, but uh, might get me into something interesting. The question is, do you think there's a market for small rockets in Europe? Well, I'm not sure about that, but maybe we can talk a little bit about space and space exploration and, um, uh, and so on. One of the things that I think is a really interesting question in, in the current time is, uh, what's the good of putting things in space? You know, since 1957, we've had the capability to put things in orbit around the Earth. So what? what what's that good for? And I think that the, um, uh, we're going to see in the next few years some answers starting to emerge to that question. So, for example, in, uh, there was sort of a comparable question about flight. You know, first of all, people had hot air balloons and so on, and then they had, uh, you know, uh, powered flight airplanes, things like that. Uh, we've had those for 120 years. Um, it's like, what are airplanes going to be good for? And at the beginning, people were kind of debating what are airplanes going to be good for, and people said, well, there'll be um, uh, the um, uh, there'll be um, kind of um, uh, you know maybe airplanes will be good for carrying the mail, maybe airplanes will be good for aerial reconnaissance for photographing the ground from a height and seeing further. Uh, maybe airplanes will be good. Well, probably they won't be good for taking carrying passengers around. That seems really hard. And then later it was, uh, as the First World War kind of rolled in, maybe they'll be good for dropping bombs on people or things. Um, so these sort of different uses for airplanes that emerged, where it wasn't obvious to begin with what airplanes will be good for. Actually, the same thing for computers. When computers were first invented as a theoretical matter in the 1930s, Nobody knew what they were going to be good for. And, and the fact that they ended up being good for storing data, doing word processing, doing communications, networking, all these kinds of things, they were, those were completely unanticipated uses of computers um, in the early days. So when it comes to things in space, there had been some expectation that you could make communication satellites. Uh, what's the point of a communication satellite? Well, basically, if you're trying to communicate from here to there on the Earth, one way you can do that is have a, uh, a wire or a piece of fiber optic cable that's laid under the ocean or whatever else that goes from here to there. Another thing you can do is send a signal to a satellite, have it kind of bounce off the satellite and come back to Earth in another place. So I think back in probably 1960, maybe even before 1960, the very first such, such device was a thing called, I think it was called Echo One. And it was a very big Mylar balloon. So those same kind of mylar balloons that one has at you know, birthday parties and so on, this was a very big mylar balloon and it was sent into space. Obviously it wasn't inflated, it was only inflated once it was in space and it was used to bounce radio signals off. And it was, uh, um, and that was, um, that was sort of the, the, the first example of being able to use something in orbit around the earth to communicate radio signals. Now things have gotten a lot more advanced since then and um, uh, there's a lot um, and, uh, um, one of the, so, so both communication and uh, broadcasting. So another thing that happened more recently was uh, the idea particularly of, of satellites that are in geostationary orbit around the equator of the earth. Um, they, uh, you know, at 24,000 miles above the equator, roughly, the, the period of the orbit around the earth agrees with the period of the day. So that means that a satellite that's in orbit um, around the equator uh, because the Earth is spinning uh, so that the, the, it has to be on, uh, on the equator. When, when the satellite is in orbit uh, around the equator at an altitude of roughly 24,000 miles, um, it, its orbital period agrees with the, the, the one, uh, uh, one day, and so it always stays over the same point on the Earth's surface. So there are geostationary satellites that are at the longitude of the US, there are ones at the longitude of Europe, and so on, all uh, above the equator. So for example, when you set up a, um, a satellite TV dish, you'll orient it so that it is pointing at that satellite. So, you know, you always point it to the south, partly to the south if you're in the northern hemisphere, so that it is pointing at a thing that's over the equator. Um, and uh, uh, that's how that works. But so for broadcasting things, if you want to kind of broadcast some uh, interesting television or, or radio or something to the US, you can do that from a satellite in geostationary orbit uh, above, the, um, above the US. Now, if you want to use it for cell phone communications, um, it's too far, 24,000 miles is a long way. And 
the signal when you say hello, it's going to take, uh, let's see, we can probably work it out. Um, well, let's see, light travels 186,000 miles per second. So that means 24,000 miles, it's 24,000 miles up. Well, actually, it's more than that, because that's the distance that uh, the satellite is right above the equator. If you work out your kind of trigonometry and, and Pythagoras' theorem and so on, you'll realize that the distance uh, to where you are on the Earth is longer than that straight up distance from the equator, unless you're on the equator. So let's give it, um, let's say it's, I don't know, 40,000 miles up. So that means that the round trip of you send a message up to the satellite, comes back down again, that's, that's uh, 80,000 miles. So that means if light goes 186,000 miles per second, that means you're looking at um, a more than a third of a second delay. Uh, you know, you say hello, and you know to get a response back is going to take more than a third of a second. That's the latency of the signal um, is going to be that kind of time uh, for you to for you to kind of get get the response back. Actually, it's it's uh, it's ultimately worse than that. Uh, let me think about that. Why that is. Uh, but in any case, the, the problem is satellites that far away kind of takes a long time to get the signal back there. And uh, if you're just broadcasting, you're never going to know whether you saw that, you know, amazing, uh, you know, football event or something now or one second late. It doesn't really make any difference. Um, so it doesn't matter when you're broadcasting, but it does matter if you're doing, you know, uh, two-way communication. So the thing that was sort of the, the innovation of uh, allowed that is low Earth orbit satellites. And it's a much more elaborate story there um, to, you know, you're handed off. If you have a satellite phone, for example, you hear this little, these days, at least, I think that may be changing with new technology, but in the satellite phones that have existed for the last uh, decade and a half or more, you hear this little as the as it hands off from one satellite to another, as one satellite uh, is no longer in view from where you are on the earth, another satellite comes into view. But in any case, that that's some. Um, um, uh, so, so one of the things is is for sort of two way communication. Uh, sometimes, you know, if you're using, if you're browsing the web, it also uh, sometimes is going to matter what the time for two way communication is. Sometimes, if you're streaming a, a movie, it doesn't really matter if there's a delay starting. Well, okay, well and good. But once it's streaming, all that matters is the throughput, not the latency of how long it takes to go back and forth and so on. So uh, in any case, the, the, um, uh, there's sort of this question of uh, what can you do with space? How can you make use of, of, of things in space? Um, and uh, for example, it isn't yet possible, uh, the, the sort of power budget for handheld phones is not really good enough to systematically have them used to, um, to communicate with low Earth orbit, you know, still a, a sat phone is still a fairly big thing with a big antenna and things like that. Um, really, sort of small things don't have an easy time with current battery technology communicating, and, and, and rather more actually antenna technology communicating with things in Earth orbit. So you end up having, uh, you know, little at least little and you know antennas that you have to be able to attach somewhere to be able to do communication with low Earth orbit satellites well. Uh, but that's something as people look to build out internet capabilities uh, to, to more areas, that's something that uh, uh, several friends of mine have companies that um, uh, are launching large numbers of satellites to, um, um, uh, to be able to, to make use of that, uh, that possibility. But so, so that's another sort of use of space. Another use of space is for uh, kind of uh, uh, doing aerial reconnaissance, remote sensing, being able to see the Earth uh, 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 frequently. And, and now there's uh, at least one company, that, two companies actually, that have um, uh, coverage of the Earth that's good enough that you can get pretty high resolution imagery once a day. And so the question now is, what's that good for? Who needs to know what the Earth looks like, what every place on the Earth looks like once a day? And oh, by the way, some parts of the Earth are cloudy and then there's more technology you have to have to see in the infrared to be able to get through that or, or whatever, if you can. Um, but, you know, it's like, what's this good for? And that's, a, that's sort of a very interesting thing to try to predict, you know, what is space going to be good for? People back earlier on were talking about doing manufacturing in space, being able to use the weightlessness of space to be able to grow more perfect crystals, to be able to uh, make crystallized drug molecules, all kinds of things like this. 
Um, uh, that I don't think has really panned out yet. But again, it's, it's a complicated issue because as the cost of, of putting something in space goes down, if it can go down sufficiently far, then new things become possible that weren't even worth thinking about before. I mean, all the kinds of things we're doing to do with streaming video and so on, back in the day, that was completely unthinkable because the, the cost of putting down copper phone line type communication technology was so high that if you wanted to have um, enough sort of copper wire with the te communications technology of the time to transmit video, that was a hugely expensive thing. Nobody would just do it for fun, so to speak. But once it becomes cheap enough, you can do it kind of for fun. And of course, that leads to things like space tourism and so on. And then, but then there's another parameter, which is, you know, what's the probability? What, how safe is it? You know, if you're launching 10,000 communication satellites and one rocket in 50 blows up, which is kind of a, has been unfortunately the, um, the typical statistic uh, back in the past, at least I haven't checked it recently. Um, you know, one rocket in 50 blows up and it's launching tens of thousands of communication satellites. Well, every so often you lose some communication satellites and that's unfortunate, but it's not, you know, it's kind of a cost of doing business. But that doesn't work well if, uh, if you're launching people um, on those rockets and so on. Um, and you have to start thinking about, you know, escape systems and, and all kinds of elaborate things like that. But it's also, uh, uh, even, even if that's the case, the kind of, um, it's, not a, it's not a good ride if, you're, if your rocket is launching and it blows up and you have to be sort of brought back to Earth in some kind of escape pod. It's kind of not, um, uh, it's sort of poor customer satisfaction, I think, in a case like that. Um, but, you know, there are, there are lots of other kinds of uses of space that maybe we don't know yet. And that's, that's one of the things that is determining, I think, the, uh, the sort of growth rate of, um, of, of space-based kinds of uh, technologies. Um, and, uh, you know, we don't know, uh, you know, if we could put things on the far side of the moon, for example. Like people say, radio astronomers say, uh, oh, my gosh, you've got all these things in orbit around the Earth. And it's like... Um, uh, and that means that when you do radio, uh, radio astronomy, which is looking for radio emissions from stars and galaxies and, and so on, um, it's, it's no good to be doing that if there are all these cell phone transmitters in orbit around the Earth, because you've got this, this lovely radio telescope on the surface of the Earth, and it's trying to listen for some distant galaxy, you know, halfway across the universe. And, and just right when something interesting is happening with that galaxy, a cell phone transmitter goes in its path goes in between it and that galaxy, and, and all it's hearing is, uh, is, is some uh, encrypted piece of somebody's uh, telephone conversation. So that's kind of a bad thing. And I, I suspect the thing that's got to happen in the end is that the radio astronomers who are all upset about, um, about uh, uh, sort of um, uh, lots of low Earth orbit satellites, I think low Earth orbit satellites are useful enough, they, they're just gonna be lots of them. People are gonna use them and the kind of, the compensation is, okay, people are gonna use all those low earth orbit satellites, but somebody's gonna make the radio astronomers a radio telescope that can be put on the far side of the moon. And if you have a radio telescope on the far side of the moon, at least right now, there's nothing, it's really quiet there because the far side of the moon is all those radio transmissions that are produced by the earth. Uh, none of those uh, are, can be detected on the far side of the moon. So it's really radio quiet on the far side of the moon. Of course, the question is, how do you communicate the results of your radio telescope to the astronomers on Earth? Because I don't think they want to, astronomers are often going to, uh, at least used to often go to all these uh, slightly obscure places because telescopes, it's, it's good to have a telescope up in the mountains high up above, um, sometimes above a lot of the weather, uh, above a lot of the atmosphere, so you don't get sort of uh, little, little glitches from, um, uh, from, from the air. Um, affecting, you know, the twinkling of your star or whatever, being able to have the light come more directly to your telescope. So there are lots of telescopes. There's ones in Mauna Kea and, and Hawaii. There's ones in the uh, Chilean Andes. Um, there's uh, there's ones in different places. There's ones in Arizona as well. But but um, there's generally, uh, you know, telescopes on tall mountains is a common thing. And uh, people, um, astronomers, at least in the past, my friends who are astronomers, it's like, I'm off to this place in the obscure place in the Andes. Um, that's somewhat degraded in modern times because the, uh, the, there are fiber optic connections to those telescopes and they can just sit in the, in the comfort of their own home controlling the telescope. Um, and uh, there's no need to actually be there for your observing night um, actually at the telescope. But uh, 
you might think, oh, the astronomers will have to go to the far side of the moon, but obviously that's not true because um, uh, what will happen is they'll be just like there are there are satellites in orbit around the Earth that allow you to do communications. You can have satellites in orbit around the Moon, which can relay the signal from a radio telescope on the far side of the Moon uh, to the Earth. And um, of course, in time, uh, you know the the, uh, um, uh, the 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 Moon orbit might get as congested as Earth orbit, but I think that's going to be a long while before that happens. Um, but uh, you know, those are those are some of the things to. to to think about there. I think one of the things about launching rockets is um, it's um, uh, the, um, uh, you know, the rotation of the earth is such that you want to launch a rocket um, to, the, uh, to the east, because what you're trying to do is you launch the rocket and you're typically gonna to try to make the rocket go into earth orbit. And let's see, how does this work? Uh, you, because of the uh, centrifugal force, basically, hmm, I have to think about this for a second. Orbit insertion is easier, I think, if you're launching, uh, if you're launching that way, if you, if you insert it into the orbit going to the east. But that's why, if you look at where people have satellite launch facilities, most of them have things to their east being uh, not much stuff. So for example, Cape Canaveral in the US is on the east, the eastern coast of Florida, uh, or near the equator, because the equator, the closer you are to the equator, the more angular momentum you have, which helps you in getting into orbit. So bad idea to have a satellite launch facility, you know, close to the North Pole, better idea to have it close to the equator. So in the US, you know, Florida is a good bet. You want it on the eastern side because you're going to have your rocket launch up over the to, to the east. And if something goes wrong with your rocket and uh, you know it, it aborts somehow, uh, it's it's or it blows up. Its debris is going to fall uh, in the in the east, um, which is in the Atlantic Ocean in that case, rather than falling uh, you know in some populated area. And so, if you look, I think um, in Australia, well, sometimes there's some places where there's a big enough desert that you can just you know launch. Uh, in the center of a continent. I think in Kazakhstan, the, the Soviet launch facilities were Russian now launch facilities are in Kazakhstan, which is a, uh, a very big, uh, fairly, uh, very sparsely populated country. So that sort of works too. Um, but uh, that's, so in Europe, you're asking about rockets in Europe. I don't think there's a lot of places in Europe, you know, Europe doesn't have a very convenient Eastern uh, kind of, um, um, seaboard and um, uh, there's not a lot of places in Europe where you get to uh, uh, to launch a rocket and if it if it fails not have it fall where people live so I think that's some um, uh, which is why for example uh, let's see the the uh, French Guiana is one place which is used for some European launches and there is another place that I am forgetting that's used that's close to the equator um, that's, that's used for some rocket launches. Let's see, the questions, there's a question here from D0. Would those low Earth orbit satellites block out the sunlight? Not a chance. Just like, you know, all the airplanes that fly every day, no real effect on the sunlight. They, they have a little bit of an effect actually because the, the, tr the vapor trails they produce, those are like extra clouds and they do have some effect. But the direct effect of the actual, you know, actual satellite, actual plane, it, it's so tiny compared to the, um, uh, the, the, the sort of what, what you see. You know, I, I have to mention a, a friend of mine has a, a company that's been involved in making uh, high altitude drones that fly at like 60,000 feet uh, where, the, where the air is nice and, uh, and smooth and so on. And uh, it has a whole plan where a drone can, can, have, uh, can get exposed to enough sunlight that it's possible to keep the drone flying for forever. If the drone doesn't fail, the drone will just fly, keep flying forever, powered by sunlight. Um, and uh, in fact, he has a uh, this company has a has a whole scheme for having whole fleets of drones where just like birds, where where you have a flock of birds and the birds are, are, are flying close in formation, 
because they're using the wingtip vortices from one bird to give lift to another bird in the, in the flock, so to speak. You can do the same thing with high altitude drones and with modern control systems. You can have these things fly at high speeds at 60,000 feet, you know, with their wingtips one centimeter apart and so on, so that they're effectively having a giant wing area. But um, one of the things that I find interesting about that uh, is that when you do that, well, so there are a lot of things that are interesting about that, that case, but, but uh, for example, you can have a lot of computation going on on those, on those drones. Um, and um, uh, that's, um, that's something that um, um, the, uh, um, uh, you, you don't have any issues with cooling if you're at 60,000 feet. So that, that allows you to kind of have, the joke is you can kind of have the cloud in the cloud, you know, the computing cloud um, that is uh, sort of centralized computation. You potentially have it in the cloud, so to speak, actually it's far above the clouds um, because you can actually have uh, uh, computation powered by sunlight and uh, cooled by the fact that you're at 60,000 feet where it's much colder um, and, and do computation there. But anyway, the, why, was I, why was I telling you this? because I, I just have this image of um, these uh, high altitude drones um, that usually will be absolutely invisible because they're, they're tiny on the, on the scale of, 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 the, of the size of the sky. But um, uh, kind of when they, when they need to be, you know, they, they have to be, uh, have maintenance done on them and things like that. And it's kind of the, the amusing concept of the sort of once a year or something, all these drones kind of, uh, you know, come in formation and decide that they're going to come and land somewhere. And it's kind of like the like you would see a flock of birds, except these are uh, uh, artificial objects that, uh, you know, once a year, just in a migratory pattern, so to speak, um, come and, uh, you know, land in who knows what, you know, Colorado or something, something high altitude or whatever, um, and uh, to be to be serviced. Um, I am going to have to go quite soon, but um, let me just uh, uh, look at... Um, uh, some other questions here. Well, there's oh, so many interesting questions. Um, a few of these are more appropriate for uh, history of science and technology. Um, uh, let's see. Okay, there's a question from Epi. This is a little bit complicated maybe for this. Um, okay, I'll just, okay, my last thing here. There's a question about using atomic clocks, very accurate clocks that base their timing. Uh, you know, usually with a clock, you like, a, like an old fashioned pendulum clock, you're just using tick, tock, et cetera, or you might be using um, some, in a, in a watch or something, in a mechanical watch, you're using this kind of, um, uh, it's again, a little pendulum-like thing swinging back and forth. You can do that on an atomic scale and atoms have the convenient feature that all atoms of a certain type, of a certain precise type are exactly the same. That's one of the things that quantum mechanics will claim for us. And so you don't have to say, oh, so I got some dirt on my pendulum or, oh, that pendulum wasn't manufactured to exactly the same length. Instead, all atoms of cesium are exactly, of cesium, whatever it is, are exactly the same. And so you can use that as a sort of precise, it's not a pendulum, but you use a sort of vibration in that molecule, quantum mechanical vibration in that molecule as a, as a way to, to measure time. Well, it turns out that one of the consequences of general relativity, Einstein's theory of gravity, is that when you have a gravitational field, um, in a gravitational field, a clock will run slightly slower. And so there's a phenomenon, it's called gravitational redshift, and um, as you, um, uh, am I getting this the wrong way around? Let me think. Um, I have to think carefully about this. It runs at a different speed. Let's not, let's not say higher or lower because it depends on what you mean exactly by gravitational potential. It gets a little complicated. So, but in any case, as you go in different, so for example, on the surface of the earth, a clock will run at a slightly different speed than where, where there's the gravity, uh, associated with being that close to the Earth, will run at a different speed than it would if it was uh, uh, somewhere out in, uh, in interplanetary space. And so the question is, if you have a whole arrangement of these atomic clocks and you can very precisely measure times, can you use that to deduce the gravitational field around you? And so, for example, on the Earth, 
you know, when you drop something, it falls under gravity roughly 9.8 meters per second per second, but it isn't exactly 9.8 meters per second per second everywhere. If you're near a mountain, for example, there's usually a bit of extra gravity associated with kind of the, the mountain and, and things will fall a little bit towards the mountain, not just straight down towards the center of the earth. So you can use those kinds of motions to detect the, the kind of gravity, but you could also in principle use timing variations in atomic clocks to, to, to figure out gravity. And, and one of the things that I'll just mention, people often say, oh, we're gonna make use quantum mechanics to make sort of these perfect secrecy systems where we're just gonna use quantum effects. I don't really believe this quite, quite works that way. That's something that comes out of our physics project. But one of the things that's always uh, a problem even in, in sort of pre our physics project physics um, is gravity is still something that has, there's an effect from those sort of quantum mechanical photons presumably have a gravitational effect. So when people say, I remember from years ago visiting an early company that claimed it could do sort of quantum encryption. And it's like, they gave this whole story about how, you know, it's physically proved that it's impossible to break this encryption. Say, well, excuse me, what if you have these very accurate atomic clocks or some measurement of gravity, then can't you tell whether the photon went this way or that way? And it's like, well, uh, yes, uh, but we don't know that piece of physics yet. So it's kind of, it's the same story very much as sort of mathematical security. It's like, we know this because we know this piece of mathematics. We don't know what, we don't know the mathematics we don't know. Similarly, we don't kind of know the physics we don't know. And um, I have to wrap up here for today. Um, and uh, there's just a, a great set of questions here, which I'll look forward to addressing, continue to address um, next week. So um, thanks for joining us and uh, bye, bye for now.